Top Med Talk. Hi, welcome back to the EBPOM 2021 World Congress. I'm Monty Mython here at this Top Med Talk studios in West London. The next session is a Morpheus plenary lecture. And Padma Galore, who I'm going to hand over to to handle the rest of this session and introduce our plenary lecturer. Padma is a professor of anesthesiology and population health and executive vice chair for performance and operations director, pain management strategy and opioid surveillance at Duke University Health Systems. Padma, congratulations on having such a long title. <laughs> it's a good job I was able to read that one. Welcome, over to you. Thank you, Monty. Good afternoon, everyone. The Morpheus Consortium is a global collaboration to advance patient-centered perioperative care through science, education, and policy. It started as a vision of three universities, Duke University, University College of London, and University of Southampton, with one shared goal, to train and be the leaders in perioperative medicine and enhance recovery after surgery, ultimately improving the patient's journey from the moment their surgery is contemplated to full recovery. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for the Morpheus Plenary Lecture here at EPOM 2021, live from London, Professor Ramani Munasinger. is Professor of Perioperative Medicine at UCL and a consultant anesthetist at UCL Hospitals. She holds a number of national positions in the UK, including being Director of the Health Services Research Center at the Royal College of Anesthetists and National Clinical Director for Critical and Perioperative Care at NHS England. In that role, she provided clinical leadership to the national critical care response to COVID-19 and is now supporting the recovery of elective care as we emerge from the pandemic. Her talk today will focus on experiences and learnings from the past 18 months. So without further ado, welcome. Thank you very much, Padma. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here at EBPOM. I wish we were physically in London doing our normal celebrations, but it's good to be here anyway. Uh, and I hope, therefore, being able to connect with so many more people internationally. My talk is going to reflect on some of the experiences that I've had and we in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom and specifically in England have had over the last 16, 17 months. And stuff that I hope that we can learn from that experience to help us think about how we can implement rapid change more effectively, more quickly, more completely than perhaps we've been able to do to date. A bit about the NHS legacy of COVID-19. And I think it would be easy to focus entirely on the bad and understandable indeed. Let's think about things that have changed. My son, about this time last year, uh, he was three at the time and he saw a picture on the front of one of my medical magazines. He said, look, mummy, that's a coronavirus. I thought, crikey, how many three-year-olds would normally have known what a virus looks like? And, and I would imagine that pretty much all three, four, five and every other age you old knows what a coronavirus looks like now. That's, that's a very small example of how, how life has changed. From a healthcare perspective, we're all living with a legacy. We've got a new disease which brings with it new pressures that has affected different countries in different ways. It means that we've got more to do and, and potentially in even less time than we had before. And we've always felt pressured in, in healthcare, I think, it, wherever you work. And, and certainly in our case in the United Kingdom, because we were hit very, very hard in successive waves over the last 18 months, We've got a pretty hurt, exhausted workforce, which for a variety of reasons will have changed irreversibly. I don't think there's anyone that will have not been changed in some way by what's happened over the last 18 months in their personal lives, let alone in their work lives. And these are all the things that we've got to contend with. And then from a patient perspective, we've got a big, bad legacy, haven't we? So, of course, we've got hundreds of thousands, worldwide millions of deaths and the terrible, terrible tragedy that COVID has brought with it which sadly has affected some countries with less sophisticated, less organised health systems, less money, much, much more than perhaps higher income nations. We've got the individual legacy for patients who've survived COVID, of long COVID in some cases, and many other sort of economic and other impacts as well. And here in the NHS, we've got a problem which I understand is not necessarily replicated, for example, in the United States, although maybe interesting to discuss that later. But because we had to pour all our resources really within the NHS into managing COVID for certainly the first wave, which came to us in March and April of last year, we had to pause a lot of our elective work. And as a result of that, we've seen a very, very sharp, steep rise in the number of patients waiting for 
elective treatment, predominantly surgery, although not entirely. And we've now topped out at more than five million for the first time since the 19, well, even even in the bad old days of the 1990s, the waiting list went as bad as that. And anxiety, of course, is that it will get worse before it gets better, despite everybody's best efforts. So that said, I'm not wishing to minimise or underplay any of the tragedy and the challenge that the last 18 months has brought all of us and the whole world. I do want to try and take a more optimistic approach to the future and try and think about what COVID has taught us about the art of the possible, focusing on critical care and thinking about the perioperative perspective in that. I want to talk a little bit about how COVID is going to, I hope, in the NHS at least, give us some new opportunities to improve outcomes for perioperative patients because like never before, the health service is going to focus on their on the needs of that group of patients as opposed to any other. So where did we start? Let's go back to pre-March 2020, if any of us can remember that far back. Um, here uh, in the NHS, our baseline position in terms of critical care capacity was not brilliant. These were headlines taken from newspapers before the pandemic. We had a chronic shortage, or it felt like we had a chronic shortage of critical care beds. This is some research that we conducted in 2017, which looks at the rates and reasons for cancelled operations at the last minute. We found that 10% of patients having planned overnight stay surgery had been previously cancelled at least once. And that was substantially higher than the NHS estimate of only being 1.2% on the day of surgery cancellations. But that's because that includes all the ambulatory surgery and interventions, which is about 70% of our workload. And it also excludes the patients cancelled the day before surgery, which quite commonly happens. So we think that 10% estimate of patients being cancelled at the last minute, if they're due for a big operation that requires an overnight stay, is likely to be very plausible. If you look at the reasons why they're cancelled or the risk factors for cancellation, the requirement for a post optical critical care bed was the highest one on an individual patient basis. Why is that? Well, this is taken from an open source website, which some of you will be familiar with. And this shows, as of last year, the number of critical care beds per 100,000 population according to country. There's the United Kingdom down on the lower end of that. And we were then in March last year faced with these really quite apocalyptic predictions of what might be required if the virus was allowed to rage without any social interventions uh, at all. So this becomes somewhat infamously known as the imperial model so you see the horizontal red line at the bottom there represents our critical care capacity at baseline. And those various curves represent the different scenarios that they were modelling for potentially different levels of social interventions and, and so on. So you can see that the prediction was that we were going to get into really quite serious trouble. And if you try and understand the gap in numbers, we had about three and a half thousand commissioned critical care beds plus about 700 additional ones. We identified surge capacity very early on anaesthetic machines, the independent sector, paediatric machines, and we're able to identify around 8,000 beds with machines that would be able to look after patients if everything else stopped. And the predicted reasonable worst case scenarios, according to those um, models that I've just shown you the pictures of, was that potentially by the 1st of March, 90,000 beds would be needed without mitigation. At that point, the government set a target of getting an additional 30,000 ventilators into the NHS by mid-April. And then this SAGE model came out in mid-March, which predicted that if we did nothing, that we could potentially need almost 140,000 ventilated beds. To put that into context, the entire NHS has only 100,000 beds. So the prediction was that we would need more ventilated beds than we actually had capacity in the NHS full stop. But that would be reduced very substantially, depending on the public health policy that was implemented. Obviously, quite obviously, after that, the government implemented the first lockdown. But we still had a gap, despite the fact that, thankfully, those predictions turned out not to be quite as bad as they could have been. So we needed all the stuff. It's not just about ventilators. We needed all of that. The space, so the physical space to put additional beds. We needed to create structures very rapidly, things like guidelines, but also Think about our estates. You know, for the first time ever, we had to worry about things like oxygen supply in some hospitals. And the staff, staff critically, the workforce is our most precious resource, of course. And critical care staff, of course, critical care is a very specialised environment. We've got chronic workforce gaps. So we were, again, not starting from a position of strength. So we were having to prepare for at least six times the critical care capacity in the NHS that we normally provide with a very limited understanding of the disease and very limited understanding about how 
effective non-pharmacological interventions were going to be, a limited understanding of transmission characteristics, and we were also preparing for a similar wave to hit everywhere all over the United Kingdom. So what did we do? What, how did we try and deal with this? Uh, so here I'm going to start talking about the art of the possible that we were able to achieve. So the first is technical innovation. In the UK, as in many other parts of the world, everyone focused on ventilators. Did you have enough? Could we get more? And, and I saw a very interesting film from Medtronic during the break, which talked about their contribution to providing ventilators globally. See, our problem was that we realised that ventilators were, I didn't know this before the beginning of March last year, that ventilators are made to order. There aren't hundreds of ventilators generally sitting on the shelf in the warehouse. For us, they're mostly made overseas. Uh, we were in a pandemic, so definition global problem, and therefore they were going to be quite hard to come by. So obviously a strategy was around mass procurement, but it was very likely that immediate deployment was mostly not going to be possible. So what were we going to do? Were we going to buy some more? Were we going to make do? Or were we going to try to make them? And the make do option is an interesting one to consider. If you go back to Copenhagen in the early 1950s, where they realised that a way of saving lives was to intubate patients, but they had no ventilators to ventilate those patients with. So they had medical students, I'm sure everybody knows this story, bagging patients 24-7 in order to maintain, to be able to keep a tube down them while they recovered from their polio. So the question that we had to ask ourselves when we were faced with not having enough was, is a bad ventilator worse than no ventilator? Is it worse than a medical student or an orthopedic surgeon standing at the bed space and bagging the patients? And of course, the challenge is, where were these people going to come from? Who, how many, and what risk was it going to pose to them? What are the ethics of that, of standing at a bed space, ventilating a patient 24-7 because you've got no other equipment? So the idea really behind what we ultimately did was to try and reduce the risk that any member of staff would be faced with the possibility of not having the equipment to support a patient. So there was innovation and there was a programme to try and manufacture rapidly ventilators that necessarily had to be simple because, as we all know, ventilators are highly, highly specialised, highly technical devices. But when they're reduced down to their simplest, they can be a bag of the box. And potentially that was better than not having anything at all. And the speed with which this took off was quite staggering. Friday the 13th of March, the original specification was written. The government met over that weekend to make a decision that this was going to happen. We met with the MHRA, which is our regulatory body, to agree the principles of the specification over that weekend. A clinical review team was assembled on the Monday. The first meeting with manufacturers happened on the Wednesday. A testing protocol was agreed by the MHRA the next day. And the speed thereafter with which things happened remained absolutely astonishingly fast. It was expensive. The cost and outcomes of the challenge were staggering. So the procurement was ultimately very successful, although not all of the ventilators that we ultimately procured arrived in time for what could have been that very catastrophic prediction that we would peak over the Easter weekend, so early April. But overall, about 21,000 machines were purchased. And the challenge, the ventilator challenge, yielded almost 25,000 machines, both mechanical ventilators and CPAP devices. The cost was high, but those machines are all either being used, donated, or being stored for use in future pandemics. And the outcomes, the innovation outcomes are fascinating. So on the left is the Penlon ESO2, which was adapted from the original Penlon anaesthetic machine that many of you will understand and know to provide ventilation. The UCR Ventura device has had a great deal of publicity. This was a collaboration between a, the university and McLaren Engineering to reproduce a updated better version of the old Whisperflow CPAP wall CPAP device and on the right hand side an innovation that is just coming to regulatory approvals now which seems like a long time but if you consider how long it takes normally to get a device through regulatory approvals from innovation through to delivery it's still staggeringly quick and this is a low flow CPAP device which as we'll have all had in some countries in particular including in the United Kingdom can potentially have some very significant advantages in terms of oxygen support, being able to deliver CPAP on very, very low oxygen flows. There was a lot of scrutiny and governance and, uh, you know, we've gone over them whether this was the right thing to do or not. There's been an independent inquiry into whether or not this approach was the right one. The fiscal evaluation was positive. The clinical evaluations were still in the thick of it. 
And critically, critically, the deployment of all of these new and unusual machines had to be supported by guidelines and training. And I'm going to come on to talk about that in a sec. So what else about the art of the possible? We rapidly created structures, physical structures, operational structures, clinical structures. Some of you will know that a number of field hospitals were created that thankfully were not really used very much, but there was a huge amount that went on other than that. There was massively accelerated guidelines, publications, everybody started using preprint servers, which got the information out to all of us much, much quicker than would normally have been the case. We created guidelines to support safe practice as far as we could. So for example, this is our e-learning for healthcare resource. It's a, it's a national resource that's supported by our Royal College and all Royal Colleges. And we just created masses and masses and masses of resources to support the use of all of these ventilators that we were procuring that people weren't used to. Very, very detailed quick start guides to get people off and running and details of how to fix problems if they occurred. We had to balance and share resources. As I'd already mentioned, in a few places, there were real challenges with delivery of oxygen, not because we ran out of oxygen, that's not correct, but because older states have pipe work that doesn't necessarily support very sudden rapid rises in oxygen flow rates in particular parts of the hospital. And so we had to set up national operational structures with regional leadership, centrally allocate resources if they were scarce, centralise support for engineering and logistics, rapidly coordinate and transfer services to move patients to places of safety where the hospitals were getting busier than they could necessarily deal with. And the third thing that I think was really critically important was the research and the use of data to understand and improve. So the story of the vaccines is well known, and I'm not going to go into that today. The story of the recovery trial and the remap cap trials are also very well understood. But we also use data on the fly operational data, clinical data provided by our National Intensive Care, National Audit and Research Centre to help guide our clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So you won't be able to necessarily see this very clearly, but on the top left, that shows how much renal support is given in a normal year to patients in intensive care. And on the right hand is the amount of renal support that was being provided to patients who were admitted to intensive care with COVID. And overall, about 27% of patients required renal replacement therapy in our first wave in March, of April last, March and April last year. So we used around 38,000 days of renal replacement therapy in about the one month peak period in England alone. So you compare that with how much we use normally in a year. We used 40% of what we normally would use in a year across the whole of the United Kingdom in one month just in England. And again, a bit like the ventilators, the whole world was having similar problems, issues related to hypercoagulable state and all sorts of other things, which meant that actually getting hold of fluids and filters became started to become a real challenge. So what did we do? Well, we had to innovate again and guidelines had to be produced rapidly. Units rapidly adapted to being able to deliver slow, low efficiency dialysis if they had dialysis services on site. Units that didn't have dialysis on site um, resorted to intermittent hemofiltration with very, very good effect. Some units started to use peritoneal dialysis in the units and were able to do so safely. But the most important thing was better practice, better ward-based fluid management and prevention, which meant that in subsequent waves, our requirement for renal replacement therapy for COVID patients very, very significantly dropped. So what has COVID-19 taught us overall? The art of the possible, rapid innovation, rapid implementation, and rapid use of data to improve care all the things that we would really want to deploy to support best practice in perioperative care as well. And what made all of this possible? How were we able collectively, and England is not alone, every country that was supported by the high income countries, certainly that were supported by effective healthcare services, were able to make this possible. What were they, how were they able to do this? The common purpose was one of the key things. We all felt like we only had one job to do, and that was to get us through that crisis. And everything focused on it, clinical practice focused on it, but also research focused on it. Um, perhaps for worse rather than better, pretty much all other research stopped or was very substantially hit by COVID because we focused all our resources on trials like recovery and remap cap. And that was great because what that meant is that we got quicker answers to the important questions for COVID. But obviously everything else has suffered as a result of that. There was no time. We had to do things so rapidly, so we had to create it. And we were able to create it through the individual efforts of thousands and thousands of people. We brought more people in, people who didn't even normally work in healthcare to support us. And of course, there was more money around than there normally is in order to try and support all of this. 
And again, because there was no time, everybody appreciated the fact that we needed to do things differently. So bureaucracy was largely slept away and empowering individuals to do stuff was a really, really critical part of the success. So time and money, we got some, we, we created time and we were given money to try and solve the COVID problem. But now what we're faced with is empty pockets and time that doesn't feel our own anymore, just as it always used to. And that's the environment in which we're now starting to have to face the backlog that we've developed. So I showed you this graph at the beginning, the backlog of elective work in the NHS that we've really got to deal with for patient benefit. Now, I think that this does present us with an absolutely unprecedented opportunity to help perioptive patients. And that's what everybody at EDPOM is here to do. And if we think about perioptive care and the definition that we usually use, say patient-centered multidisciplinary care from the time of contemplation of surgery through to full recovery afterwards, the contemplation bit should be about good information and shared decision-making, the waiting for surgery bit, thinking about treating waiting lists, which we are now faced with very long ones, as preparation lists and the during and after avoidance of harm and I think we really really have an opportunity to try and make that work and use some of the things that we've learned from COVID to help us do that and, and what we want to end up with is this chap here coming in after his major major surgery and being able to go for a walk down the road that's what we want to get back to so contemplating and waiting for surgery we published just last week some truly cross-disciplinary multi-specialty guidelines where surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses, physicians, we all got together to do the right thing as far as thinking about how we should treat patients in the run up to surgery, particularly in light of the big waiting list that we've now got in the NHS. And our key messages are around shared decision making, individualised risk assessment and assessments and optimization, focusing on comorbidities, functional capacity, nutrition, psychological preparedness and so on. And very importantly, about keeping in touch with patients while they're waiting, not just putting them on a waiting list and then leaving them alone for six months, 12 months, however long it will take, but to really try to actively support them if they want and need that support. We're very clear about what shared decision making means and that it should be embedded throughout the pathway from the time that the patient gets referred by their primary care practitioner or comes out of a screening programme, perhaps all the way through right up to the last minute on the day of surgery their right to ask questions, their right to change their mind. We're not actually that great at communicating risk. And obviously that's a very central part of shared decision-making, but we can improve. And there are some tips in the guidance about how to do that. We need to know very, very early on in the pathway about high risk patients so that we can get to them as early as possible and start to try and get them better prepared for their surgery. And so that really comes down to collaboration between primary and secondary care and also patients completing self-assessments that will help guide us as to a triaging system essentially for patients and how much attention they need from us. Part of that is using screening tools liberally as early as possible in the pathway. And there are so many different things that we should be screening for. Functional capacity, nutritional depletion, psychological health, frailty, obstructive sleep apnea. Those are key ones, but there are others as well. Because screening early, enabling earlier diagnosis, facilitating optimization gets patients fitter for life, not just for surgery. The evaluation and optimization part of it, we've always focused on COVID comorbidities. We've got one more to think about now for patients who've had COVID-19 perhaps, both the impact that comorbidities have on functional capacity, but also the condition specific control and management and whether that needs to be optimized. But the syndromes or the multi-dimensional comorbidities, things like frailty, multimorbidity in itself, polypharmacy, these all need specific evaluation, fitness, nutrition, and psychology. We should be able to do the basics, all of us, of all of this. And that's what we're there for in preoperative assessment clinics. But the advanced patients, the patients who need specialist input, require specialist support from perioperative physicians, from specialty specific support for some comorbidities, dietitians for malnutrition, exercise physiologists for exercise programs. If they really are the thin edge of the wedge, there won't be that many patients that need that type of input. But if we don't ask, we won't find out. And, and as a result, our patients won't come as well prepared for their operation. We're really trying to encourage the concept of waiting lists being treated as preparation lists. So changing the way we think about them, taking the opportunity for preparation, as I've described, really going for adopting, implementing surgery schools where we can hold group classes to support patients in learning a little bit about what to expect from when they come into hospital and starting to put them in the driving seat of their perioptive care. 
And there's a real necessity while patients are waiting to understand deterioration. The things that patients want from us as a single point of contact, they want to know who to call if something in their condition changes. They want guidance on how and when to contact us. And the biggest thing they want is not to be cancelled or postponed because of a change in their own health. So what do we need to know while patients wait? We need to know if they still want the operation. Patients' conditions change, they get better sometimes. If they still need the operation, if they are still fit for the surgery, and if they've become more or less urgent for any reason. And we've really got to set the, the systems up to enable us to be able to communicate with patients more effectively than we've done historically. So guiding them about what they need to let us know about, contacting them, simple things like text messages or a phone call to ask them if anything's changed and, and primary care support for understanding what has changed. And when thinking about all of these things, it's really, really tempting just to go for the really technical, izzy wizzy stuff, apps that patients can use to let us know about things and so on. But always we've got to be mindful not to widen health inequalities. That's another thing that the pandemic has really, really thrown into the spotlight. We've always had health inequalities. There have always been groups that have been disadvantaged, but suddenly now everybody knows about it. And so in every aspect of healthcare, we need to really, really think hard about this and respond appropriately to the patients who don't necessarily get in touch with us because they are the ones that are most likely to be disadvantaged. Avoidance of harm during and after surgery is the other key aspect of what we should be aiming to do for patients that are now coming to us for their operations. And when the big day comes, ideally what we should be aiming for is ambulatory care if at all possible. So do the surgery, optimise the pain relief, and then get them out to recover as quickly as possible. Protocolised but individualised care which gets them home as soon as possible for the inpatient surgical patients is the other key principle. Now, uh, we all know and love enhanced recovery. And uh, one of the things that we've learned in, in the UK through the enhanced recovery programme that Monty Biden first implemented and that we've continued to try and develop and improve over the many, many years is that hospitals don't deal very well with complexity and it can be really, really hard to effectively implement a complex pathway. It feels a bit like trying to turn the super tanker. And innovation is difficult. Although I've given you lots of examples in the pandemic of where we were able to overcome this, uh, this is known as the innovation adoption cycle. We know that on a normal day, we have a department that looks a bit like this with a very, very tiny minority of innovators and early adopters and a much bigger group of people who are laggards who won't change their ways for any reason whatsoever, no matter how much they've tried to, we try to persuade them. And we have evidence of this. So this is quite an old slide now, but nonetheless gives you the key message, which is that stuff that appears to be a no brainer, diabetic foot care, cholesterol screening, flu vaccination, it can take years and years and years and years for these things to be adopted into practice. On the other hand, the pandemic's taught us that some things can happen really quickly. So what was amazing about dexamethasone and the findings of the recovery trial was not just that a treatment was found quickly and thankfully one that was cheap and easily available on the whole, but the speed with which it was adopted into practice was absolutely staggering and very, very unusual for healthcare. So what's the difference between dexamethasone for COVID and everything that we've done before and since? When you think about improvement or implementation, you can think about different theories to underpin them. And, and this is perhaps my favourite, that sounds a bit geeky, but the one that I go to when I try to think about how to make change happen. It's called normalisation process theory. And the idea is that if you follow this theoretical approach, you should be able to normalise your new innovation into practice. So when you develop something, it should be coherent, so easy to define, convey and understand. Support cognitive participation. So do we all, does the whole team, including the patient, agree with the end goal? Does it support collective action? Will it make our lives easier or harder? Is this something, you know, it's all very well with some new fandangled innovation. If it's going to make everyone's lives harder and mean they have to stay an extra two hours at work every day, it's very unlikely to gain success and adoption. And then finally, will it be capable of reflexive monitoring? Will we get to the stage quickly where instead of people saying, why are we doing this? They're saying, why aren't we doing this? And I think a really good example of that is capnography in the operating room. Um, you wouldn't start an anaesthetic, or well, certainly in the UK, we wouldn't start an anaesthetic without knowing that we had a capnograph on the breathing system. 
And I think that that's a really good example of an innovation that is subject to reflexive monitoring. Now, if you think about dexamethasone in COVID, I think it pretty much fulfills all of these criteria really, really easily. It's simple. Everybody agrees it's going to, with the end goal, it's going to save lives. So we've got to do it. It's not going to make our lives harder to do it, particularly. And there will come a stage, I think, that people go, well, why haven't you given the dexamethasone to this patient? Maybe not on day one, but by day two or three, somebody will have asked the question. If you think about hemofiltration and the way that we changed the way to our approach to renal replacement therapy in the pandemic, as I described earlier, even that, which is much, much more complex, potentially fulfills normalization process theory principles, at least in the context of the pandemic. It's coherent. We've got to change the way we do things because we're running out of stuff. We all agree with the end goal because the patient's got to have their RRT. It's not necessarily going to make our lives easier, but it'd be a darn easier than seeing patients getting worse and worse and worse with renal failure. And yeah, it's capable of reflexive monitoring. If you think about enhanced recovery pathways, on the other hand, they feel still a little bit more like the super tanker. The basic principle is easy enough to convey. We strictly process care for every patient in order to reduce complications and length of stay. But if you then drill down into the detail, you start to get into trouble with the cognitive participation because you start to argue about the basic, you know, do you have an epidural? Do you have this type of block? The collective action people will be complaining about, for example, people complained about using check because they thought it would make their lives hard. And the reflexive monitoring, again, a very, very complicated pathway with 20 different elements is very unlikely to be capable of robust reflexive monitoring. So how do we fix this? So the first thing is thinking about thoughtful design and implementation. I think we're all familiar with the concept of care bundles. The IHI described these as small bundles of care, three to five elements only, robust evidence, little or no controversy, consensus and a high degree of acceptance. And I think the bundled approach to healthcare improvements is one that it was very, very much in vogue a few years ago, perhaps a little bit less so more recently, and I think we should be going to it. And there are really, really good examples of where this has worked before. I've already mentioned capnography, but also cardiac arrest protocols. These change every so often when the Resuscitation Council decides that they've reviewed the evidence and there's a reason for it to change. And we really rapidly buy into it because it makes sense. It should be better for patients and it should be better or no different for us. Cognitive participation and collective action. And the reflexive monitoring, well, we need all the help that we can get with things like that. We need data, audit and feedback. I've given you an example of how we were able to use data provided to us about the rates of renal failure in COVID in order to very rapidly adapt and improve the care that we gave to patients. But there are other methods as well. So for example, we can use technology, nudge theory. So some of you will have seen this before. These are urinals in an airport in Germany and uh, painted into the middle of them, there are two little flies and, and the flies were aimed at um, encouraging men to aim for the fly in order to reduce spillage onto the floor. And guess what? It works. Now, if you want to adapt that into healthcare, we've seen, for example, nudge type interventions improving compliance with um, best practice in ventilation in the operating theatre. Because what do you do? You just change the default settings on the machine to low tidal volumes, and then lo and behold, you get better compliance. But a really, really key thing to reflexive monitoring in enhanced recovery implementation, I think, is keeping the patient at the heart of our work and empowering them. Because in fact, if we inform the patient that the aspiration should be that they achieve various goals at certain times during their perioperative care, then what we should be doing is encouraging them when it doesn't happen to say, why not? So can we distill enhanced recovery down into a bundle? Perhaps we can on the concept of drinking, eating and mobilising within 24 hours of surgery. And I'm going to embarrass Monty a little bit now because I think it was Monty that came up with this concept. It is based on Henrik Kellett's original, more simple overview of enhanced recovery. But the dreaming moniker, I think, has come from Monty and he'll correct me if I'm wrong in discussion. And the idea is that you encourage patients to drink, eat and mobilise within 24 hours of surgery. These are the definitions that we've adopted in the United Kingdom. So drinking free fluids eating a soft diet and mobilising with the maximum support of one person. We've been measuring dreaming rates in the UK perioperative quality improvement programme for the last four years. And I'm very excited that we've got some results which we can share. And there's going to be a much more detailed presentation on this in one of the abstract sessions later in the week. 
presented by our early career colleagues who have led the analysis. And I'm grateful to Matt, Georgie, Sam, and, and everybody else for doing this work. But the bottom line is that some patient factors do influence a patient's ability to dream at 24 hours, but most of these are modifiable, for example, through preoperative optimization. There are loads of hospital level process factors which influence it, and all of those are modifiable. Pain, drains and tubes are really bad for dreaming at 24 hours. And that's really, really important in terms of targeting inpatient improvements. And the hospitals with the highest proportion of patients who dream have a two day shorter median length of stay than the hospitals that have the lowest compliance with dreaming. And that really is a no brainer. So if you think again about going back to this theory, does dreaming tick the boxes? I think it really, really does. And if you want to then go back out from those very, very basic core principles back out to the bigger picture of enhanced recovery, all roads end in dreaming because you need preoperative health screening to optimize comorbidities. You need to empower patients by helping them to share in their decisions. You need to optimize them. You need to adapt your surgical anesthetic and analgesic strategies and techniques. But if you start with the principles of we're going to get the patients doing these things within 24 hours, and then when you're unable to, you look back and try and understand why not, that may be a better approach to implementation of enhanced recovery than perhaps trying to go full tilt on the whole pathway. So thinking a little bit back to what COVID has taught us, what this little virus has taught us, I think we know what the art of the possible is. But we know that that's probably only achievable when all our energy, all our resources, all of our money, all of our thinking goes into the management of a single disease. And that's not realistic. Our uh, challenge now in the NHS is dealing with this elective backlog and really trying to support patients waiting for their operations. And I see that as now an opportunity to really implement dreaming, go back to the basic founding principles of enhanced recovery, and getting this fella back to his nice walks in the park. So summing up, I think uh, the legacy of COVID-19 is going to mean different things to different people for very, very bad reasons for many people, but hopefully some good reasons for many of us as well. We have seen and we have lived and we've delivered the art of the possible. And I hope that there will never be another time like it again. But now is an opportunity to embed everything that we've learned and the best possible perioperative care for patient benefit, to take advantage of the fact that the spotlight is being shone on perioperative care, at least in the NHS now, to get these things embedded into practice and try and get something positive out of the legacy of the last 18 months. Thank you very much for listening. Ramani, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Padma, and if you'll there and can join us again. Ramani, as Padma rejoins us, can I just ask you, uh, we, we tend to sort of not have too many questions for plenary lectures, but could I just ask you to reflect on the data challenge? I mean, here we are involved in possibly the biggest business in the world, healthcare, and a global complaint is lack of data, which you referred to in your talk. Yeah, one of the things that was striking during the peak of the COVID pandemic is almost every day of the week in the United Kingdom, we engaged in a national data fest. We had, you know, graphs and next slide, please, such that everyone was all over the numbers and we still get them on the news every day of the week. Well, can you help us? You know, where's the disconnect in all of that? It's really interesting, isn't it? And I think that comes down to that collective focus on the single thing, which was COVID. Everybody then put their energy into that data. There was a whole load of other data that was really, really important about waiting lists rising, uh, all the other casualties of COVID, the non-direct casualties, so mental health, for example, you know, all sorts of things that we didn't see the data for yet, and is now all emerging as we now start to reset our focus. I think the other thing is that we've got to think about how much energy we've got for looking at data. And I think, uh, again, we were all hungry for it at the very beginning. I think after a while, I think we all got a bit beleaguered by it. And I think when thinking about using data to improve the quality of care, we've got to really focus on what's important. And I think therefore that same kind of almost reductionist approach, what's really, really critical, what's the really critical information that we've got to have? What are the half a dozen or you know 10 uh, quality metrics or whatever it might be that we want to focus on? get those right, get us up to sort of 80, 90% compliance with those things and record our outcomes and then move on to the next 10. And I think perhaps that 
is an approach that we could think a bit more about, not just having any data, but the right data. Great, thank you. Padma, I'll hand the chair back to you. Thank you very much. Remy, that was fantastic. The effort itself, everything that went into it, you could sense the coming together of so much, as you said, the art of possible. Where would you summarize, if there was one thing you would do differently now, in hindsight, what would that be? Oh, that's tricky. There's, <laughs> it's tricky to narrow down one thing, I think. I think, well, I think as a country, I think the one thing that we will be next time is better prepared. When you think about sort of preparing for a pandemic, people focused on flu type pandemics with the specific issues that they would bring. This was very different with the impact that it had on the very, very severe illness, the, the amount of ventilation required and so on. I think that was not necessarily anticipated. And I don't think we will, I hope that we will have learned enough, not just us in the NHS and in the UK, but globally, we will have learned enough about what is missing to really focus on what's required now. So for example, the oxygen problems that we've heard about from all over the world affected even some hospitals in high income countries such as yours and mine, you know, making us think differently about those sorts of challenges. They were always there, but they weren't just right in the crosshairs. And so hopefully that will help us prepare better for the future. Great talk, uh, Ramani. Thank you. Monty, were you? Thanks, partner. Ramani. It's from Tessa Bailey, and it says, is there mileage in having a national perioperative outcome data set that all hospitals should strive to be able to provide? Thanks. Yes, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think, as I say, keeping it as simple as possible, I think this is something we should aim to do. Thinking of a very simple few process metrics, streaming would be a good start, and then some basic outcome data. Yes, of course, we can risk adjust and risk adjust and risk adjust, but... If you get the processes right, the outcomes will follow, and maybe that's the way we should be going. So, Padma, before I hand back to you to close, just a challenge, Ramani. Before the bureaucrats get back from holiday, could we crack on with that while we're still partially empowered? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I'll see you for tea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for a great lecture, Padma. Thank you. Thank you, Ramani, for a great lecture. Thank you, Monty, for helping out with the moderating. Excellent talk, excellent discussion. Uh, we look forward to doing this Morpheus plenary lecture next year in person. We are all looking forward to putting this uh, pandemic behind us and moving forward in a way, you know, like the chap Marmony showed, walking, taking a walk in the park. We would all love to be doing that more easily and more comfortably, just as we used to do before. So we look forward to that and an in-person meeting next year. Thank you again uh, to both of you. Excellent. Thank you. Top Bed Talk. We've got a big one coming up, don't we? We do. We have our combined EBPOM Ireland, EBPOM USA, or EBPOM Dingle, EBPOM Chicago meeting coming up starting September 21, running through September 23. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, coming soon. So uh, Desiree, can you still buy tickets for it? Absolutely. You can go to ebpom.org, book now, book in your ticket as soon as you can. And when you do that, you actually get access, Monty, for the entire year of content that we put on ebpom. So I know a lot of people are asking, though, about CPD and CME points. Well, for the meeting itself, if you watch the whole thing, the Royal College of Anesthetists of Ireland have given us 27 CME credits. It doesn't work for every constituency. So if you're in the USA, for example, for the US component, you can pick up 12 accredited, you know, fully certified approved points if you follow the processes required. So we'll see you all soon. Desiree, excited? Okay. Oh, super excited. Wonderful conversations from people from all over the world. We're making the best of this virtual situation. So if you haven't gotten your ticket, ebpom.org, book now, and we will see you in just a little over a week. It's awesome. Monty, see you soon. See you in Ireland soon. Cheers. <laughs>